Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining us from. Welcome to the Africa Health Business SICPA webinar themed The Role of the Patient and the Public in Combating Counterfeit Medicines and Vaccines. My name is Saloni Chandaria from Africa Health Business. At this time, allow me to highlight some guidelines for the session. We request all to observe the allocated time. The session will last for 90 minutes and will be recorded. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A at any time during the session and they will be responded to as much as possible. To highlight the session agenda, we will have various experts who will be speaking during this webinar. We will have a moderator from Africa Health Business and experts from Fight the Fakes, NCD Alliance, GSK, an independent consultant, Good Light Pharmacy Africa, Sproxil and PATH. Thereafter, we will have an open forum where participants can share their views. And then we will have passing shots from the experts and conclude the session. And now, let me introduce the moderator of the day, Dr. Daniela Munene, Head of Consultancy at Africa Health Business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saloni. Um, Africa Health Business is really a privilege to host this webinar, uh, which is the second in a series of events um, that we are holding to highlight the importance of feed for purpose technologies to help patients protect themselves against uh, counterfeit medicines and vaccines. Um, in an earlier uh, forum, a round table that we held in January, we had regulators and policy makers, and we were focusing on the government's role in uh, protecting uh, the industry and protecting patients from counterfeits. And from that session, we had several uh, recommendations uh, and two of which uh, have led us to today's event. Two of those recommendations were that we need to continually sensitize the public and patients and health workers about um, anti-counterfeit technologies available and the need for constant uh, vigilance. There was also a recommendation that we need to deploy a combination of various innovative technologies for authentication to reduce the chances of counterfeiters cracking them. We need, we need always to be ahead of the counterfeit industry and keep iterating so that they don't catch up with our technology. So having um, discussed that at a policy and regulatory level, today we want to talk about the role of the patient and the public. How can we sensitize them and empower them to use these technologies? Because as innovative and sometimes as expensive as they are, they're only as effective as the rate of utilization by the end user. So are patients actually using the technologies? Are they finding them easy to use? Are they even aware that they're, they might be at risk? Are they motivated to use the technologies so that it can, we can have a return on investment as industry as healthcare professionals, we can be sure that our patients are protected and the patient can feel that they have a role and that they're empowered to protect themselves. And so we're really glad to bring you this webinar and we have lined up um, a panel of experts to help us unravel the role of the patient and the public in, uh, in um, anti-counterfeit technologies and in protecting themselves against harmful medicines. So I'd like to invite uh, to, to introduce all our speakers and then I will ask them uh, one by one to make their remarks. So I would like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Adam Aspinal. He's a chairman of Fight the Fakes. He's the first chairman of Fight the Fakes and senior director at Access and Product Management at Medicines for Malaria Venture. In his role, he's responsible for that venture's portfolio and for launching the drugs under the portfolio. He has over 20 years in the pharma and biotech industry, and we're very glad to have him here on this uh, webinar, and he'll, he will set the stage. Uh, he'll be the first speaker. We also have Dr. Catherine Karakezi, who is the executive director of NCD Alliance Kenya. And as we know, um, chronic patients uh, face an increased risk from the threat of counterfeit medicines because they're on these medicines for life. So it will be really glad to hear Dr. Karikezi's um, insights. We're also joined today by Dr. Eva Amwai, the Head of Regulatory Affairs East and West Africa at GSK. Dr. Amwai is a seasoned regulatory affairs professional with regional exposure in consumer pharmaceutical products in Africa. She is also engaged um, in the Global Self Care Federation that is really aimed at empowering patients uh, for self care in their health and their medicines. We also have Mr. Willy Sorine. He's a consultant uh, to the Swiss government health programs in Somalia and Somaliland. 
And naturally, we want these technologies that we, we have as industry to reach the farthest uh, and hardest to reach and remote areas to protect everybody. And we are going to look forward to hearing um, Mr. Sorine's insights. We also have uh, Dr. Sejal Shah, the chief pharmacist at Good Life Pharmacy Africa. She has spent over 20 years in the healthcare and life sciences industry, including at AstraZeneca, Aga Khan University Hospital, uh, various hospitals in Nairobi, and is now chief pharmacist at the largest chain of retail pharmacies um, in Africa, which is Good Life. And then we have Dr. Ashifi Gogo, who is the CEO and founder at Sproxil. He's an engineer, mathematician, and physicist by training. Uh, and he's a CEO of Sproxil, a global technology company with product authenticity and customer loyalty solutions used by over 30 million consumers worldwide. As you can see, we have a very, very uh, distinguished uh, panel of experts. And in addition to this panel, we also have John Paul Omolo, who's a senior advocacy and policy officer at PATH. He's a public health care professional and a health policy analyst. He has extensive expertise in health policy formulation and has an interest in safeguarding uh, our patients against counterfeits. Thank you very much, our distinguished panel, for joining us. So I will go straight away uh, and invite our first speaker, who is uh, Mr. Adam Aspinall. Please set the stage for us. Please make your remarks. Thank you very much, Daniela. It's a, it's a real honor to be here and thanks very much to the organizers for the in invitation to participate in this very important meeting. Um, so as you've heard, uh, I'm Adam Aspinall. I work in my day job at Medicines for Malaria Venture, looking after the uncomplicated malaria portfolio and the whole area of falsified and substandard medicines falls within that remit. And uh, I also have the privilege of being the, the chair of the Fight the Fakes Alliance, uh, which is a, a not-for-profit organization based in Geneva uh, with the aim of raising awareness and helping combat the scourge of falsified and substandard medicines. And uh, in case you, you're not familiar with the, the Alliance, uh, we have a broad membership uh, representing industry, academ academia, not-for-profit and professional organizations. And we were set up uh, originally as a campaign group back in 2013 and then became established as a, a formal NGO in 2020. So, so my, my job is to set the scene. And um, I guess the, the first question, if I can have the next slide, please, is why do we actually need to fight the fakes? And, and I guess I'm already preaching to the converted here because almost by definition, the very fact that you're on this webinar means that you have uh, some knowledge and an interest in the topic. Um, so just as a, a reminder, perhaps I can share a few facts just to set the scene. Uh, the first one, as you can see on the left, is that according to the WHO, um, this is a, a very widespread problem affecting probably the majority of countries in the world. However, we do know that in lower and middle income countries, uh, around one in 10 medicines are thought to be fake. And that's a really huge issue. And we know that Africa in particular is disproportionately affected uh, by this issue. Um, we know that pretty much every therapeutic area is affected, um, not just vaccines, which we've heard a lot about over the, the COVID crisis, but anti-malarials in particular, um, cardiovascular disease, anti-infectives, and so on. Uh, some of these areas are more affected than others, particularly my own area, anti-malarials. Um, and it really is a massive issue. Um, it's thought that around 155,000 childhood deaths occur every year due to falsified uh, anti-malarial drugs. That's a huge, huge number. Um, we've kind of become immune to big numbers over the, the COVID crisis. But 155 thousand children dying completely unnecessarily um, because they're taking medicines that have no or very little active ingredient is simply criminal. Um, what are the impacts of uh, these falsified medicines? The obvious one is failure to treat disease. Um, my own daughter, in fact, uh, suffers from a very serious and potentially life-threatening autoimmune condition, and she relies on good quality uh, immunosuppressant drugs to keep her alive. 
if she had any doubt um, about the, the, the content of these drugs, or if they, they were falsified, it could cost her her life. Um, it's really important to maintain that trust in medicines, and it really is eroded by falsified medicines. Um, we know that uh, antibiotic resistance is a potential consequence and a very serious one of uh, falsified and substandard medicines. Economic losses um, perhaps seem secondary to the, the cost in lives, but it's been estimated that the, est the, the economic cost of fake medicines is between 10 and $200 billion every year. This is a massive issue and, and very big business. Um, so that kind of sets the scene. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, so we know that this does affect uh, pretty much every country in the world, um, but everybody that lives and works in Africa knows this is a particularly bad problem in the African subcontinent. Um, and the estimates are that over 40% of all reported substandard and falsified medicines um, are picked up in Africa. The problem with that figure, of course, is that it's only as good as the reporting systems um, that generate those numbers. And we know that in many countries, they're suboptimal. We also know that um, the numbers aren't reported very often, purely because uh, particularly kids with serious illnesses and infections are very often expected to die. Um, and so if you've got a child with severe malaria that doesn't respond to treatment and they die, Who's going to look at it? Who's going to investigate it and say, this is actually because of the, the drug they were given being false? Um, so it's very likely that these figures are underestimates. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. So we all know the uh, issue of falsified and substandard um, protective equipment, uh, anti-COVID medications, anti-COVID vaccines, uh, particularly. And I guess if there's one silver lining that we've seen as a result of the COVID pandemic, it's the fact that um, it's shone a spotlight for many people for the first time on this whole issue, um, particularly in more developed countries. Um, people just didn't realize that falsified medicines even existed. And it's, it's come as a shock and a wake up call uh, to, to many. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Just, um, I don't want to sit here and throw lots of numbers at you, but just um, a couple of examples from my, my own area, which is anti-malarials. Um, I mentioned earlier that these are amongst the most widely reported um, fake med medicines. And we know that Sub-Saharan Africa has by far the biggest malaria burden uh, anywhere in the world. And in one WHO survey that you can see here uh, of drug quality in six African countries, around a third failed to meet the quality specifications, a third. And when we're talking about huge numbers, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases, that's a really serious issue. Um, but within that, that figure, we saw huge in, inter-country variations. Um, so if I take Nigeria, for example, the figure was nearly two thirds failed to meet specifications. And in Ghana, Cameroon is around 40%. So this is a massive, massive issue in Africa. Um, and many of you will remember that back in 2009, uh, Nigeria managed to intercept a consignment of over, well, it's around 700,000 uh, fake anti-malarials. Imagine what would have happened potentially if they'd have got into the supply chain and uh, people have taken ineffective medicines. That could have been a huge number of lost lives as a result. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to highlight a, an article by Paul Newton, who many of you will know, and, and his colleagues, um, in which he describes um, manslaughter by fake artesanate in Asia. I, I would actually go a step further. The people that manufacture these products know full well that when you are manufacturing a fake um, life-saving medicine or vaccine, then people are likely to die as a result. So I would say this is murder and not manslaughter. Um, and it affects a huge number of people. You can see on the left that uh, the WHO um, estimate that substandard and falsified anti-malarials may contribute in Africa alone to around 116,000 deaths 
which is uh, it's, it's an almost inconceivable number of unnecessary deaths. Um, this is definitely not, as many people think, a victimless crime. Next slide, please. So uh, this is why we're all here today, uh, about the importance of um, raising awareness and uh, sensitizing the public. It's one of the reasons that um, Fight the Fakes Alliance was set up. Um, public awareness um, and education campaigns on the danger of counterfeit medicines and the risk of substituting legitimate medicines for cheaper ones needs to be ongoing and needs to be rolled out widely. Um, we know that public sensitization is important because um, first of all, it understands uh, or helps the patients understand how to spot uh, fake drugs in the first place, uh, understand the risks of using them, um, how to use verification tools. Uh, I know Ashifi is probably gonna talk about this later on about some of the things that Sproxel um, have done, which have been incredibly important. And also to uh, report suspect medicines to the uh, authorities. But at the same time, in order to educate the public, it, that needs to be matched by uh, continuing medical education of healthcare professionals um, to make sure they understand uh, the current technology and how to use it, and also how they can help identify and report uh, falsified medicines. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I think um, I've got one more slide left just to round off before I hand over. So just to bring it all together, um, we know that this, this scourge is something that affects everybody, but Africa is particularly badly affected. And the people who are affected are very often the most vulnerable people in society. We know that counterfeiting is, is huge business um, worth tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars. And the people that uh, engage in it, these are very, very smart people. They're very flexible, they're very creative, and they're trying to stay one one step ahead our challenge is to stay one uh, step ahead of them and we know that education is one of the, the best ways we can do that um, there are lots and lots of ways that um, we need to respond both through strengthening supply chains national regulatory systems um, improving detect detection technology and making it more widely available um, but the starting point's always got to be uh, the sensitization and education of both the public yeah, and healthcare practitioners. And in that sense, every single one of us here can make a difference. So uh, that's all I'd like to say at the moment. Thanks for the opportunity again, and I'll hand back to Daniela. Thanks, Adam, for giving us that high level overview of the threat that we are facing with counterfeits, particularly in Africa, and showing that this threat uh, spans the divide of communicable and non-communicable diseases. But now let's hear from Dr. Catherine Karekezi, if you could give us insights on how um, this threat affects chronic disease patients. Welcome, Dr. Karakezi. Uh, thank you very much, Daniela. And on behalf of NCT Alliance of Kenya, I'd like to thank the organizers of the business, health business for the invitation to speak at this important forum. And um, yeah, just giving us the opportunity to talk about non-communicable disease. Uh, just by way of introduction, the NCD Alliance of Kenya is an umbrella body of different organizations working in the area of non-communicable diseases. And amongst our membership organizations led by patient, patient -led organizations as well as professional bodies, local and international NGOs, and other civil society organizations. Now, in the area of NCD diseases, <clears throat> We, we realize that these, as Daniela mentioned at the beginning, these tend to be lifelong conditions, which require lifelong management and also monitoring. So essentially, um, they depend on medication and monitoring. And this, as Daniela mentioned, increases the patient's lifetime risk of encountering a substandard or falsified product, theater medicine, or the diagnostics that they require to monitor. So essentially, as the burden of OCD in low and middle income countries increases, at the moment in Kenya, OCDs um, account for about 41% of planning, and this is projected to increase in both Kenya and other low and middle countries. This means that we do need uh, 
a reliable source of safe and effective medicines, as well as effective technologies and communities to monitor. So, as I mentioned, diagnostics are an, an essential component of management of non communicable diseases. I should mention that non communicable diseases include conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, chronic uh, lung diseases, as well as cancer, mental health disorders, uh, injuries, and so on. So, essentially, when it comes to diagnostics which are required to monitor these conditions, if we consider, for example, diabetes, people living with diabetes need to monitor their sugar in order to be able to determine the dose of insulin, for example, that they need. So if they do have, they're using calcified glucose strips, it means they're going to have inaccurate readings about their blood sugar. And this is likely to lead to giving themselves inaccurate doses of insulin, which are potentially um, fatal. So essentially, as the burden of NCDs increases in the countries, there is going to, there is likely to, the burden of, not the burden, the availability of falsified commodities, which are people who require these commodities. So again, substandard and falsified medical products. Um, threaten to undermine the progress that we're making towards meeting the sustainable development goals. I believe you're all aware of the sustainable development goals, which actually talks about um, the management of non communicable diseases. So, essentially, the products which are either substandard or falsified are likely to threaten the health of those who are taking them. Again, I think mentioned, the factors which are likely to contribute to increasing availability of falsified medicines in the supply chain is firstly the increased demand for medicines, the vaccines, and other medical products. Issue Dr. Karekezi, your, your audio is breaking. Allow me to interrupt. Your okay. audio is uh, not very clear. I was uh, wondering if you could, if, maybe if you could switch off your video, the audio yeah. might be clearer. Mm. Okay. We've been able to follow, but just to make it a little bit clearer. Okay, fine. Thanks, then. So I'll just talk about what are the factors which are contributing to the increase in falsified medicine, especially in the area of non-communicable diseases. Firstly, the increased need for these medicines, the poor supply chains, and as we know, the e-commerce and especially and um, yeah. So those are some of the factors which we need to consider. And then also there's a culture of self-diagnosis and self-subscribing, -subscri especially with patients living with chronic conditions. And of course, there's an the issue of the weak um, or non-existent health systems. And um, yeah, so there are various issues which are contributing to those things. Uh, in terms of the impacts, I think some of them have been mentioned. There's the economic impact because of increased out-of-pocket expenses increased burden on healthcare professionals who, who are likely to continue treating the same condition because of the lack of effect of medications which are being used. The social economic impact of the use of falsified or substandard medicines, the lost income, which comes from the prolonged illness. And especially one thing I need to mention in regard to non-communicable diseases, if they're not well managed, they're likely to lead to um, life-threatening complications, which again are very expensive to, um, to manage and lead to an increase in morbidity and also likely to lead to early or premature death. So again, the socioeconomic impacts, the loss of, loss of income, loss of productivity, one is always sick and having to go back for other medication, costs associated with deferred treatment and diagnostics, outpatient visits, and the additional time off from work, which may lead patients into a vicious cycle of poor health and likely lead to poverty. We did mention the health Im impacts. Uh, maybe just to mention the issue of falsified and substandard vaccines. 
as uh, has been previously mentioned, the use of such vaccines is likely to lead to um, a compromise the immunity of the patients who are given these vaccines. There's also the potential risk in terms of using non-sterile, unidentified liquids, which may lead to toxicity, the risk of death. And of course, a disease will not be um, inoculated against. In terms of NCD, some of the vaccines which may be qualified, the hepatitis C vaccine, and also the human papilloma virus vaccine, which is required for cervical cancer. And as we are all aware, there's a global campaign to eliminate um, cervical cancer, which makes this a prime target for um, falsification because of numbers um, which will be required to inoculate um, the girls. Uh, basically, in terms of the call to action, what can we do about it? What can patients and the public do in order to fight against counterfeits? And basically, the, uh, I think one of the things is just to be aware that these falsified and substandard medicines and products do exist. The need to source the medical products from known and reliable sources and to be suspect of any unnaturally, unnaturally low priced medicines. Be attentive to packaging and uh, presentations of medicines and above, above all, avoid self-diagnosis and self-prescribing. The need for education awareness and sensitization of the risk posed by counterfeit medicines is critical. And I think we all need to be aware, and especially persons living with NCDs need to be aware that they do have a right, and this is a human right, to education on medicines and medical products that they, that they use. They need to know what their condition is, the medicine that they use, the dose, and how and when to use the medicines. Um, they also need to be aware that substandard and falsified medicine products lead to so have a social economic cost, and they also damage their health. And above all, to understand using these medicines will not control the non communicable disease, and is likely to lead to the development of complications, which are very um, difficult to manage and are going to impact on the quality of their life. So essentially using falsified and substandard medicines exposes one to life-threatening conditions, reduced quality of life, risk of everything. In addition to all the economic losses, the increase of out of pocket spending that these medicines are likely to have on. So essentially, when it comes to non-communicable diseases, it's just important to be aware that even though these are life-threatening conditions, one does need to continue seeking medical attention at the registered facilities to source their medicines from registered pharmacies and other outlets which are regulated by the, by the government and the regulatory authorities. And I think one other areas that I need to mention is the issue of the African Medicines Agency, agency which is now going to come into force. And I believe one of the things that the African Medicines Agency will look at is regulating our medicines in Africa as a block. So we hope that this is something which will contribute to the reduce in the availability of falsified and substandard medicines in the mm. continent. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karikesi. And it's really good to see uh, now more than 20 African countries having ratified and deposited their ratification instruments to the African uh, Medicines Agency. Uh, thank you for showing us the perspective um, from the chronic disease patient uh, side. Uh, now we'll welcome uh, Dr. Eva Amoy to tell us about the role of manufacturers in engaging uh, the public and educating them and educating patients. Welcome, Dr. Moy. Thank you so much. Can you confirm you can hear me? We can hear you loud and clear and we can see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I have, uh, as Daniela previously um, uh, introduced me, I have vast experience in regulatory affairs and I must declare right now that this is not only views uh, these views are not only from the company I work for currently, but from my 
experience working from both uh, manufacturers and distributors and how we combat um, counterfeit medicines. Um, so thank you. Next slide, please. So you may ask from our side, how do we define a counterfeit medicine or a vaccine? Um, this is an exact or near exact an authorized copy of a branded product that is intended to deceive patients into believing that it's a genuine product manufactured by or authorized from the manufacturer. And hence, that's why we call them a counterfeit. Uh, counterfeiting uh, does not only apply to the actual medicine, but can apply to a package, a label, um, incorrect ingredient, you know, something that, um, that all of this uh, encompasses a counterfeit. Next slide. So just some quick indicators um, of how we identify counterfeit and how also consumers can be able to identify counterfeit. Um, the, the reason why I mentioned consumers is I know there's been a lot of talk of over-the-counter medicine and uh, I am passionate about self-regulation. I know uh, Dr. Karekezi has just talked about NCDs and I know this is a lifetime um, use of medicine. These patients use these medicines for a lifetime and they should be taught how to be and they should know uh, how to identify or just some quick indicators of a counterfeit medicine uh, when they go and pick their medicine. So this would be a very low price, a product that is not sold in that market. Uh, maybe it's in a foreign language, maybe it's a pack in a foreign language, um, incorrect manufacturer's logo. Maybe you can find um, the logo that you've been using is green and now it's um, lighter green, maybe a lime green instead of the jungle green that you're normally used to. So if that's an indicator. Maybe a poor quality packaging, you can find that your medicine um, is in a poor quality, uh, not the normal one that you're used to. It's something that you should also ask about. And uh, when you see for, for us who sell uh, medication, um, and Dr. Um, Cha will, will talk about it, incorrect low details format, on the path, uh, maybe specific to your market, you'll see maybe this is not the way we, we, we have our medications registered in Kenya. And uh, those are just quick indicators that maybe a product may be counterfeit and you can ask. Next slide. So you might ask, what do manufacturers, what have manufacturers done to help patients identify counterfeit products? So as a minimum, uh, we expect that manufacturers should at least put a, a hidden anti-counterfeiting feature uh, in the packaging of their uh, product uh, so that they can be able to identify this product if it's authentic or not. Some are using QR code, some use an identifiable tape, but it's, we, we advise that to a minimum, manufacturers should use one hidden anti-counterfeiting feature. Uh, also, we also say uh, this anti-counterfeiting feature must be uh, difficult to detect and not easily copied so that the counterfeiters don't copy that feature. We know that is a problem. And also we must, we must have a visible anti-counterfeiting feature, which in most cases is, an, um, is a tamper proof or a tamper evident uh, product um, feature. Um, we also advise that uh, this, when we are doing this, when we are including these anti-counterfeiting features, we should work with the, with the marketing companies uh, to assess the potential risk and uh, consideration of how this might impact the consumer confidence. So we've seen sometimes that when we include some anti-counterfeiting uh, anti features, the consumers come back and ask, oh, is this the real product? Is this the real, um, we've seen something has changed. And we, we normally uh, advise that most manufacturing companies do this along with their marketing to just say that uh, be on the lookout. You've seen how many companies uh, say that look, look out for this feature on our product and authenticate it using this code. 
So such things are the things that we should also be advertising as much as we advertise our products. Uh, we should be advertising this to the people who sell and to the consumers. So the other thing that we uh, advise is manufacturers must carry out a regular review of the effectiveness of the anti-counterfeiting features. So uh, this, is, this is very good so that the patients may be able to say, look, oh, I didn't know this, uh, but now I know and I can report if I find out, just to know if even the people who sell uh, know the anti-counterfeiting features. And then um, the manufacturer should also include tamper evident measures to identify opportunities to combine the anti-counterfeiting solutions. So all these things are some of the things that we think about when we manufacture a brand and ensuring that the brand goes to market and the users of the brand know how to identify a counterfeit from an anti-counterfeit. And even when it's reported back to us, we can easily um, you know, say this is our product or this is not our product. Next slide, please. And you might ask, what can patients do to help reduce counterfeit? Um, the reason I talk about this, and um, very, very, um, this slide, I'm very passionate about this slide. It's because I, as Danella said, I, I work with the Global Healthcare Federation, and um, and we uh, we actually advocate for self care. Um, where people or our patients can get medicines and treat the normal diseases um, like headaches and uh, some coughs here and there that you can go to the market and pharmacies and buy these medicines. And therefore, I feel that at this point of purchase, patients should be able to identify a counterfeit product in an, and a product that is uh, real, right? So how do patients reduce counterfeits? Buy your product from authorized pharmacies and healthcare outlets. Um, many pharmacies these days have a way of authenticating if the pharmacy, especially in Kenya, if the pharmacy is authorized, please do a look at that from your end. Uh, be our ears and eyes in the market. If you come across a suspected, even if it's a suspect, we don't, uh, you don't have to prove that it's counterfeit. Uh, please report this with the details uh, to the manufacturer. It is a mandate given by the Pharmacy and Poisons Board and most of the healthcare, uh, the health authorities, uh, regulatory authorities in Africa that uh, manufacturers should have a contact and an address and patients can use these contacts and address to call back or email or send back the product. Um, and I always advise that if you suspect the product is counterfeit, please do so so that other patients may be able to um, may be able to evade this risk. And for the sales and pers uh, sales personnel and the personnel working at pharmacies and other healthcare outlets, may it be nurses uh, or the people who utilize the product, provide us with market intelligence, right? If there's an unexplained decrease in sales, um, maybe there's a counterfeit, a counterfeiter that has come into the market and is selling that. Or if there's, uh, you know of that kind of um, intelligence, let the manufacturers know, let the distributors know, let the authorities know, report it back so that we can be able to uh, act accordingly uh, with, with what, is, um, what is required for such incidences. Um, I think that would be the end um, of my presentation. And I would just like to, to reiterate that this is a very important subject um, for both patients and manufacturers. And we, we can work together to ensure that we combat uh, counterfeit products in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moy. Um... Now you've told us about the responsibility of manufacturers uh, putting both overt and covert uh, mechanisms on the path. We've also had, um, you know, uh, from the perspective of the NCD Alliance, how chronic patients are, uh, are at risk. And this brings me to um, Willie Sorine, our next speaker. 
Willie, if you could just uh, uh, give us insights into the need for all actors across the chain, whether you're the one who's putting the technology on the production line, or you're the one handling the medicine as a doctor and, and treating your chronic patient, or you're the pharmacist, um, what's, what's the need for collaboration? Uh, because when we have one break in the chain, then the patient is at risk. Sorry, I didn't realize I have muted myself. I hope everyone can hear me well. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. The, the matter of collaboration um, must be strongly enforced by the statement that the system is one. And there is no way one piece or one segment of the system will function effectively without the other. In fact, um, as up to recently, the patient was not considered part of the decision making or the processes or the thinking, but now everything must incorporate the patient. Let me go to, I had prepared two slides. Let me go to the next slide. Let me talk. I, I love nowadays to, to shake up the tree a little, be a bit controversial, get people to think and let's exit the common trodden path where we are comfortable with ask ourselves real questions that may make us change things. Now, traditionally, the health system, that the health system has always been considered to be the clinicians, the pharmacists, the paramedics, and the enveloping policy. They viewed the patient as a passive subject. That's the subject. You go to a bedside, observe the patient, everyone is writing notes, speaking very fine, polished English, the patient speaks very deep, uh, Embu has no knowledge of everything, but is just waiting to see what will be decided on her behalf. And that shall be it, but the, the participation by the patient is very limited. Now, interestingly, over time, because of technology, the patient has become well-informed. Now, to be well-informed doesn't mean to be well-knowledgeable. You're just getting a lot of information. And begrudgingly, the system has accepted the the patient as a partner. So now, as we are going forward and talking about things, we must also wonder, how do we involve the patient in this collaborative approach to ring, ring, ring fence and strengthen the supply chain to ensure that it is not infil infiltrated by counterfeits? Now, consequent to this empowerment of the patient, the patient, as I said, is very uh, well informed but still poorly knowledgeable. And therefore the system must support the patient's translation of the information into proper utilizable knowledge. Uh, the system must become transparent. There is a lot of opacity in the system that this patient cannot navigate the system. And still, I'm still very much talking about the, system, the patient now so that in my next slide, I look at the supply chain to see how this can be reinforced to make it a bulletproof against the counterfeits. The system must become uh, navigable and responsive to the patient. And as I've mentioned again, the most important thing to overcome now is the purest approach that we have in the standard build of most systems, not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, but globally. The purest approach says, if you are not a, a pharmacist, you cannot do that. Or if you're not a clinician, you cannot do that. If there is a very verticalized approach to issues in a very purist manner. And, and this is making everything weaker. The, the advancements in technology and everything has collapsed things. And we, are no longer, we can no longer afford to operate puristically. We have changed that mindset. And, and um, at the end of it all, the chief of party, the most responsible party in the, in the safety and security of medicines is the regulator. And we must all very forcefully reflect back on the regulator on the weaknesses, the failures and the successes of the supply chain or the health systems as designed to deliver medicines to patients. Let's go to the second the next slide so that I, I've been given the question to, look at the importance of collaborative effort amongst all actors in the supply chain so that we ensure we maintain the integrity of the products in the quality and in the handling. The quality of products has to do with 
the manufactured product, the handling conditions of the product, the presentation of the product to the patient together with the accompanying instructions for proper use of, of the product. This is all the elements on, of an effective and functional chain of custody that enables the medicine to achieve the desired effects. Now I have compressed the supply chain into three pieces. This is, I have written there, this is a shortened supply chain. It, the supply chain simply means chemicals enter a manufacturing plant and come out as medicine, which is handed over into the distribution system, which hands this over into the retail outlets, either retail or hospital outlets to be given out to the patients. This in a standard operation requires it to be foolproof. If one tablet enters that system, it should arrive at the other end as one tablet, not as one syrup, not as uh, two tablets. Every time there is an infiltration into the system by non-authorized products, it creates safety risks and consumption risks to the patient. And each member of this supply chain has specific roles they must play and they are governed by certain practices. For example, the manufacturing is governed by expectations on good manufacturing practices. And they try and ensure that medicine comes through clean and reliable because the first thing is they have a quarantine state. Medicine is not released until it has gone through quarantine. There is a tracking capabilities built in, there's pharmacovigilance required in the market and there is recall measures. When you, have, when you come into the distribution system, you still find the same governance and procedures that help uh, the medicines to be held properly. And when you get to the outlets, the either retail or hospital outlets, these are all also underpinned on certain professional ethics and practice requirements or standards, and also good practices along the road. If any of these requirements fail, the supply chain will fail. It will not fail in one. If it fails in one piece, it has failed in totality. You can't say at least our distribution is good, but our retail is bad. It fails in total when it fails in one piece. So that in, um, is the first point I'm making that the supply chain is whole or nothing. It's a mutually exclusive equation. If there is a failure in one piece, all of it has failed. There is no redeeming aspect when one part fails. So all of us then must work together to ensure that we reinforce and bulletproof so that there is no failure at any point. I mean, if any failure arises, it must be picked out quickly and all parties must work together to mend it. Now, if we extended this supply chain, it will go to the patient. And let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves, what would, would you be your effect if you went to a pharmacy today and the pharmacist confessed to you and said, by the way, the medicine I give you, it might be a counterfeit. Just pause about that. Think about it. The reason patients uh, do not rise up in arms is we never tell them of that poss possibility. But if we were to be open and tell them there's a likelihood you will get a substandard or affect medicine, then we will have a different dimension of a problem that we have. I have uh, kept the patient out yet to look, to look at this supply chain. Of all fundamental issues that we must address is that the regulatory board is the all encompassing partner in the three pieces or all the pieces of the supply chain. The regulatory board, if you take the example of Kenya, before a product is manufactured, the regulatory board, the pharmacy and poisons board visits the, the, the production plant to ensure it meets minimum required standards. When it comes to distribution, it is the regulatory board that registers the, the distribution practitioners and regulates their practices and activities. When it comes to the outlets, this is the retails or hospitals, it is also the regulatory board that maintains the standards and provides oversight on them. So we must also be willing to say that at any time if there is a failure, the first point of call to truly raise an alarm around is the regulatory board failure. It is a failure at the regulatory board. Now, some of the things we can do together to enable uh, 
sustained functionality of the supply chain is. Can we all agree to, in, to integrate tracking capabilities into products? I remember one time uh, in my previous working life, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm just wrapping up now because um, the time allocated is limited. We've tried very much to integrate scanning capabilities into products and requested or required every product to be scanned at every point when it is leaving the system. So it leaves manufacturing, it is scanned. It leaves the distribution, it is scanned. It leaves the outlets to the patients, it is scanned. And all this data is gathered and used to reinforce and rebuild the systems. But somewhere, somehow, there is always a pushback against these technologies that will make the system foolproof. So the regulatory body and ourselves as collaborative partners must think about all these situations and work together towards ensuring that we place technologies at the center of this to enable the systems to work. And, and um, my final parting shot is that the person that owns the mandate to ensure that these te technologies and solutions are adopted is the regulatory board. If the regulatory board wakes up today and says all products must carry a tracking capability on it, it will become a mandate that is implemented immediately. It will not go through a lot of wishing and a lot of hoping and a lot of fantasy. It will become a reality almost instantly. And so all of us, we must also go back to the regulatory board and ask, Shall we lament about all these problems forever or shall we require you to take action and make it possible? It's a very collaborative effort. If one part of the system is broken, the entire system is broken. And thank you very much for having me as a speaker for this uh, session. Uh, it's a very worthwhile uh, discussion and I hope we have more of this because this is a problem that's lingered for decades. Thank you very much, um, uh, Madam. Most welcome and thank you for those insights. Um, the chain is only as secure as the integrity of each part. And you know, we should also use leverage on technology to provide visibility across the chain. Very well put. Um, a reminder to participants that um, you need to uh, put your questions on the Q&A tab. Uh, and I request uh, my speakers uh, to look out for those questions and answer them as they're posted on the Q&A tab. Uh, we, I see more people have joined the webinar. Uh, for those who've just joined, um, this is a webinar um, in collaboration with SICPA that Africa Health Business is holding on um, the role of the patient in uh, uh, protecting themselves against counterfeit medicines. And now uh, I will uh, move to Dr. Sejal Shah, give us last mile perspectives what needs to happen at the last mile so that when the patient is going home with the medicine, we know that they're safe. Thank you so much um, for giving me this opportunity to speak at this forum. I will compliment um, what my colleagues have said um, so far. Um, and for me, the big take home is that um, give me next slide, please, Daniela. Um, it is really important for us to educate, sensitize, and make aware our patients so that they can differentiate what these fake counterfeit medicines are. And, and it is for them to understand that counterfeit drugs are dangerous by their very nature. And why is that so? It's because they are produced under unsafe manufacturing conditions and they're not inspected by regulatory authorities. And hence it's impossible for one to know what ingredients these products actually contain. And, and if you are subjected, uh, even by mistake, um, you know, and you administer these drugs which are substandard, it, our patients must be aware that they may be detrimental to, the, to, to one's health. And you know, what does that mean? Um, 
It can have adverse side effects, including treatment failure, resistance to medicine, toxicity, and even death. So, you know, it, it is serious and we must take it with that um, importance, how important it is, um, you know, to take the correct quality, genuine medicine. And, and hence also, my recommendation is refrain from self-medication unless you know where um, you have sourced this, sourced the medication from. It is really important that we maintain the attributes of international standards of quality, efficacy, and safety. And these attributes have to be maintained at all points of the supply chain up to the point of care to achieve a positive health outcome. Next slide. So the other important thing is that how do we ensure our patients know that the drug they have is safe? So it's as simple as, you know, always if you've got a prescription or you've got chronic medication or acute medication, ensure that you um, ask your doctor or your preferred pharmacist to show you actually, um, you know, what it looks like. Um, appearance, you must compare your the current package that you're going home with to your previous one. And the most important is, is the feel, the actual feel. Is your medicine tasting the same? Does it have odd um, shape? Does it have different colors in it, some specs? that you've noticed? And then, you know, is, it, is, is the medicine working on you? Are you getting better? Um, it is really important that you must contact the prescriber immediately if you're not feeling well or in any doubt and report any anomalies to the pharmacy. One can be, if you see the package is tampered, it could include tempered expiries. Um, Sometimes, even with this COVID, we've had this occurrence of drugs being unavailable. So if, if your drug is unavailable, then confirm with your doctor or your pharmacist as to what alternate you should take, but do not strive to get it at an unusually cheap price because that you must treat that with caution. Because if somebody's enticing you with something that is unusually cheap, then you must have doubts in your mind. That is this really correct? Um, and and you know, one request to our patients also is to gather all the information they can have and report it back, either to their prescribers or to us, the pharmacists. One important point I always um, advise upon is what is important to you? Is it your life? You get one life or is it the money? You, you can have money today, but you can have money tomorrow. You may not have it, but what about your life? You just have one chance. You have your life once. So it is so important to look after that one life that we have and ensure that we always administer the right medication. And, and to, to, to conclude, I would like to say that patients must always buy their medications from authorized, reputable pharmacies 
which could be retail, or if you want to buy it from hospital settings, by all means. And to say here, hashtag a better you every day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sejal. Uh, I think our patients don't always realize that, you know, it may be a matter of life and death. And it's our job at the last mile to, to let them know that it, it could be a matter of life and death. Uh, getting a, a medicine from uh, an unauthorized outlet or a suspicious medicine. Thank you very much for those insights. Um, now we move to Dr. Ashifi Gogo. If you could uh, elaborate for us a little bit about the technologies that are available uh, for anti counterfeiting, uh, uh, as anti counterfeiting solutions on medicines. And also, how can these technologies be made uh, consumer friendly so that we increase their utilization rates? Welcome, Dr. Gogo. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's been some great comments so far, and I'm glad to see so many participants. Um, we, we looked at the issue of counterfeiting from a who loses the most uh, angle. And if you look at uh, the party that loses the most or puts the most on the line when it comes to the impacts of uh, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, uh, it's clearly the patient, right? The patient is the only one who has to ingest the product uh, typically and uh, you know, stand to bear the consequences of, of doing so. And in looking at a patient-centric approach for addressing counterfeiting, we put ourselves in the shoes of the millions of people who um, go to pharmacies uh, every day and, and roadside shops and, you know, sellers with goods on <laughs> carried on their head that as we realize the, the supply chain isn't as uh, formalized everywhere. Um, and we realize that they don't have uh, adequate support or advice when uh, looking at the authenticity of a product. You know, you can try to compare the packaging, you know, you could, um, you know, taste and so on. But usually by the time you're tasting, you've already purchased the product. And so um, we're wondering what can you do to help the patient have a new tool in their arsenal to help them avoid uh, purchasing a product that could potentially harm them and also help them report the places that are selling these suspicious products. And we came up with um, the, the solution that uses unique codes on products so that the patient can send the code in by the, the text message or uh, WhatsApp or use our call center and it'll be for free. And they'll be able to get a response indicating if the product has a code that was issued uh, by us and applied at the original genuine factory uh, so that they can go ahead and make the purchase. Or if it comes back saying this code is highly suspicious, maybe it's been used already, uh, then you can see that the patients could report the incident to the regulatory authorities. Um, so that's how Sproxa was born. Uh, we connect brands to patients by placing uh, product verification codes at the factories of the original product manufacturers uh, that can be tracked alongside the entire supply chain, uh, but also very importantly, verified by the end patients, uh, no matter where they buy their drugs. Uh, we, we can't uh, uh, overhaul the pharmaceutical supply chain in Africa overnight, uh, but in a more, more modest time span, we can roll out technologies that can protect the patients uh, across the various uh, areas where they have therapeutic, uh, therapeutic needs. Um, Sproxel to date provides uh, these solutions primarily in Nigeria with some uh, operations in Kenya. Uh, we've been able to provide uh, several of these uh, scratch-off stickers that go on the physical product that consumers can use to verify products. We've uh, provided over three and a half billion of these because they go on the individual packages. Uh, and about 30 million uh, patients have already used our services to make sure that they don't get uh, tricked into buying a fake product. We also realized that um, when consumers have a response that says it's not an authentic code, uh, they might not know what to do that easily. And it's also extra work for them to report this to the government. And so we have a service where we'll call the consumer as well. 
uh, and then ask them, where are you standing? How did you get to the shop? You know, give us directions so that we know how to find it because you can't always uh, rely on GPS for, for these uh, remote locations. Um, and then we can create a case file that we file to both the brand owner, the genuine product manufacturer, as well as the uh, regulatory authority for them to conduct their pharmacovigilance uh, advice. And so um, Adam mentioned earlier on uh, the impact in malaria. Uh, malaria is one of the areas where we focused a lot when we started. Uh, we realized that in Nigeria that has the largest population under one flag on the continent, uh, that if we focus there for malaria, given it's uh, a, a, a problem, uh, a challenge in, in Nigeria, as, as in many other countries that are endemic in, for malaria, we could probably have the most impact. And so we launched with the Nigerian FDA, uh, NAFDAC, in 2010, a product verification program that covered all malaria uh, drugs. It was a mandate that NAFDAC put out to have consumer-facing technologies uh, be required for malaria drugs. Uh, around that time, the counterfeit uh, and substandard rate uh, per NAFDAC was around um, 20%. 20% of malaria drugs in 2010 in Nigeria failed uh, the, the test that uh, the regulator assessed on these drugs. And over time, over the last 10 years, uh, you know, since 2010, uh, about 18 million Nigerians have used our services to verify malaria drugs. And I'm glad to say that we, we discovered from the head of the Nigerian FDA that um, the failure rate for malaria drugs has fallen from nearly 20% to 1.3% based on their last assessment in 2019. Um, so, you know, we've, we've gone from people walking into a shop and having a one in five chance of buying a, a malaria drug that's most, most likely not gonna help them to now a one in 77 chance, uh, which has greatly improved the odds and, and very likely saved uh, millions of lives in, in that area. So we do have some validation that this approach of giving consumers technology that's designed appropriately for them can help move the needle uh, and, and give them better options for, uh, for care. Now, uh, to conclude, uh, a couple of things that have come up as we've uh, worked on this on the continent for uh, over 10 years now. One is uh, consumers have needs beyond authenticity. Uh, we usually have the conversation on authenticity, but then consumers usually have medical information needs as well. How do I use the product? Uh, my wife is pregnant. Can she take it? And, and so on. And using authenticity as a, a trust point to open avenues to have those additional conversations could be quite uh, interesting and also useful for uh, consumers. You know, we have a, a speaking avatar that goes with certain products that after you verify, you can play a, a recording that shows you how to use the product based on information that's already on the product packaging. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to read that tiny little leaflet uh, that comes with the product in so many different languages that are not relevant to, to what you speak. Um, so going beyond authenticity to give the patients more value and more support when they go purchase their uh, pharmaceuticals is something that is, uh, is quite exciting for us. And we're looking forward to uh, additional engagements, especially in East Africa to expand our impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gogo. And it's, it's really remarkable to hear that um, a technology as simple as a serial number sent by SMS uh, caused such a dramatic decline in uh, counterfeit uh, antimalarials in Nigeria. Um, so that, that actually makes me uh, correlate uh, Dr. Gogo's uh, presentation to a comment that I see um, on the chat from Maureen Kajo in Nigeria. She says that medicines still sell in markets. It sounds like it's open markets um, and not by any professionals. So despite uh, the remarkable achievements through technology, such as we've heard uh, from Dr. Gogo, uh, I think it's not enough uh, for industry to do their part and healthcare professionals to do their part and patients uh, to do their part. So that brings me to um, uh, Mr. John Paul Omolo to just wrap this up for us, because having each done our parts, it seems that 
you know, regulation is still an issue and we can't complete that circle of, of, of trust, you know, when that is still, government still has a role to play. Uh, what would you suggest that government needs to do for us to safeguard the patient and to complement uh, what industry and professionals um, have already done? Over to you, Mr. Omolo. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniela. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I thank you know, the um, organizers for thinking about this timely conversation. Um, for introduction purposes, um, John Paul, as Daniela has mentioned, and for the sake of today's um, uh, discussion, I wear a different hat. So um, I sit in the Africa Medicines Regulatory Harmonization um, uh, Partnership Platform as well as I, I lead the advocacy work for regulatory system strengthening across Africa. PATH, I work for PATH and PATH is a member of the Coalition for Health Research and Development, which is also a coalition that works within the country, that's Kenya, to strengthen regulatory systems because we bring um, a unit or uh, the different voices of civil societies to strengthen regulatory systems. And for the organization in itself, PATH uh, is a global international organization. And our main agenda is to be able to ensure that uh, we enhance health equity and um, make sure that, you know, um, uh, the most marginalized are able to receive uh, the best quality of care, um, the best quality of care um, uh, uh, wherever they are. I think noting that you know we have a lot of disparities within the health uh, sector and the outcomes that come out of these um, uh, disparities around the world are usually emblematic um, uh, uh, of you know the, and the whatever the health system is able to provide and specifically in, in sub-saharan africa uh, weak regulatory systems are a uh, contribute um, uh, to a larger extent uh, onto these disparities. And of course, the regulation of the health product is a critical component um, of every country's public health system uh, that would ensure high um, quality, uh, safe and um, effective health technologies uh, that would reach the people who need them. However, um, we, we do know that regulatory capacity vary from country to country. And most of um, uh, the earlier speakers have mentioned this with some of the national regulatory authorities being under-resourced or overburdened. And currently, and COVID-19 showed us this, globalization of medical products manufacturing has made it increasingly difficult um, for national regulatory authorities to independently uh, guarantee safety, um, quality, and subsequently uh, create uh, delays that would, you know, um, uh, with the with the different regulatory authorities, there's always this level of delays that then happens uh, as a result of the review process. Next slide. So, with all these things, um, why then would we? Be concerned about regulation, and I'll, I'll try to go quickly about on on this slide because some of the things have been mentioned by the earlier speakers. Um, we are aware that regulatory approvals are very essential in ensuring that um, you know we guarantee safety and efficacy of health products, and conversely, the use of ineffective or poor quality or outdated medical products can result in poor health outcomes. Um, and I think Dr. CJ really mentioned that in, break, in, in depth. And of course, it's the responsibility of governments uh, to primarily, uh, as, the, as their primary responsibility to regulate medical products. Previously, um, about in 2018, just to give an example, uh, PATH did a modeling study and this modeling study was in three, in five East African countries and um, uh, five other uh, Zazibona countries. And it was looking at what would it take uh, to introduce or to regulate products and introduce these products, uh, you know, two years early in, 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 in into the market. Um, and, uh, you know, we modeled around um, uh, uh, 
amoxicillin, the dispersible amoxicillin tablet, as well as the heat stable capitocin, which is used to manage the postpartum hemorrhage. And just by introducing these products early into the market, we realized that we are able to save 23,000 lives um, uh, with just by introducing them two years earlier. So why is this important? The reason as to why we are seeing substandard and falsified products get into the market is because many a times either one, the products that are in the market are either too expensive or out of reach for the common um, uh, citizen, or two, that there is no um, um, uh, product or, uh, that would easily address uh, the, the, the conditions that people um, uh, would need them for. So what happens is the scrupulous individuals would get um, uh, products into the market to deceive people around what they can be able to do. And that is why one of the main contribution of uh, regulatory um, uh, systems, when we are able to introduce products early into the market, then we, are, we will always be ahead of the game. I think one of the speakers mentioned that people who produce uh, counterfeit products usually try to be one step ahead of the game. And out of it, if we can also strengthen the regulatory system at country level, at regional level, and at, at the continental level, then we are assured of you know, uh, product uh, safety and efficacy at all these levels, including the cross-border levels. And of course, some of my um, earlier, um, uh, uh, the earlier speakers have mentioned you know, some of the impact, especially antibiotics and uh, anti-malarials, which we've seen that in, the, in, in Africa are highly, um, uh, uh, you know, um, we are seeing a high number of those as uh, substandard or falsified. I think I wanted to mention, you know, we've been mentioning substandard, falsified, fake drugs, but sometimes we need to know that when you're talking about what a substandard product is, it is generally that which is out of specification. These are those medical products that fail to meet their quality standards or their specifications. And you find that this is usually happened most, mostly at the point of manufacture. Um, but when we are talking about falsified, this is where now we, no, at, at substandard also, you'll, you'll find that it could be an issue of, you know, at the point of transportation, at the point of storage, that could really degrade, um, uh, degrade the, 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 the standards of, of, of the product. But falsified is where there is that deliberate or fraudulent misrepresent, as one of the speakers mentioned, um, in terms of its identity, its composition, or the source. But irrespective of what it is, whether it is substandard or whether it is um, falsified, or what others would call the fake. Um, poor medical products can result into a variety of, you know, of factors that has been mentioned earlier again, um, including, you know, uh, antimicrobial resistance, um, uh, adverse events um, following the, the consumption of, of those products, and several others. And as, um, uh, you know, it has also been mentioned, it's the patient that is really um, uh, bearing the greatest burden because, you know, uh, you use your money, uh, you you get uh, the, uh, the medication and at the end of the day, you don't get well, that means you're going to spend more um, and your disease might even get worse. And I think that is why uh, the next slide, we should really think about um, why this is important. So why should we be concerned? Of course, as mentioned, substandard and falsified medical products cause a lot of harm and, when, um, and fail to treat the disease to which they were intended and leading to a loss of trust uh, and confidence in the medicine and most importantly, into the healthcare system. When people lose trust into the healthcare system, then they would go anywhere else, including um, uh, uh, traditional herbalist, which in some places uh, our traditional um, medicines might work, but I think we also know the issue around, uh, you know, the toxicities with some of those uh, drugs that have not been verified to be safe. But that only happens when people lose trust uh, in the healthcare system. Of course, substandard and falsified medicines also um, can 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 um, uh, be less effective uh, against, you know, the diseases that they're meant to treat, and can also cause adverse events. 
and of course they would also uh, pose a great uh, threat uh, in the global health security and the ability of um, you know um, of, of a strong and resilient health uh, health system that would be able to prevent um, and treat and detect um, infectious diseases. And I think that is one of the key things that um, uh, we should be able to, to be worried about. And one thing that would like also to mention is that, um, and um, maybe uh, the likes of Dr. Gogo would be able to help here. We need to be wary about products that are being sold e through internet or e-commerce because of the fact that, you know, most of the people who've known who were in business of selling fake or substandard products have realized that the systems are really strong and the surveillance system uh, can easily pick them. And therefore they've resorted into e-commerce and they've found a way there because in e-commerce, uh, the product leaves whichever country it is or whichever town it is, and it will be delivered to you at the doorstep. And sometimes because you are the one who went and sourced for it, it, it becomes very difficult to even start following up. So we need to be very wary. And as some of the speakers mentioned, buy products from well-renowned um, uh, outlets. Um, the next slide um, is talking about, and what can governments now do? Which was the main question that was posed to me. I think there are two things at this moment that I want to really um, stress on. Number one, um, the African Union heads of state right, um, uh, passed um, uh, a, a, pro, a, a, a process or a policy that is the African Union Model Law on Medical Products Regulation in, 20, um, in 2005, in 2006. And because of this, countries are meant to adopt the African Union Model Law in their attempt to strengthen their internal regulatory system, but secondly, also to adapt other principles like the principle of reliance, so that you know, we are able to share Intel, we are able to share uh, a number of things that are cross-border. And therefore, the AU model law uh, is one of the tools that governments should be able to adapt across Africa. There was a study that was done by, um, uh, I think UNDP about, um, uh, in 2017, and so far, less than half of the Africa member countries had adopted the AU model law, including some of the very strong members of, 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 um, of African Union uh, member states. The second thing that uh, you know we need to do, and I'm happy, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Karikezi mentioned it, is that. Africa member states needs to ratify the African Medicines Agency because we, with that, we are assured of a continental proof or um, watertight um, regulatory system. And the African Medicines Agency will also equally help strengthen the capacities at country level, at the REC level, as well as at the continental level, as um, in, in including, you know, in support of. Um, of, of the surveillance system. Of course, the other thing that we've seen, um, the next slide, the other thing that we, we would like also to, to see is, you know, how, and because it would be, it would be, I think it would be a disservice if we speak about all these things, the markers and all this, but at, at the household level, how would you be able to identify some of these um, uh, substandard or falsified uh, products? Because we know that you know um, uh, at advanced levels um, where uh, 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 Dr. Gogo and the team they would follow and they would track it through a system. Um, uh, the medicines, uh, national medicines regulatory authorities will put them into a lab. But at household level, how can you be able to identify some of these substandard? One is to look at the expiry versus the manufacture date. You will always find that sometimes with the substandard products, uh, the expiry date comes earlier than the manufacture date. That should raise a flag when you see such a thing. Secondly, is the issue of discoloration or change of color of the drug or the look for any unusual, or you need to look for any unusual smell because you would always tell when something doesn't smell normal. And when that happens, um, you are meant to, you know, uh, suspect that product and even report it. The third is if it is a syrup, there would be some unusual suspensions that you could see. And 
because of that, even if the product is unopened, please don't consume it. And of course, the last that I would like to mention, and this is not the entire portfolio of things you can do at home, is look at the packaging condition. Some of them would be bloated. Some might even have uh, spelling uh, mistakes. It is very rare for a renowned well institution um, or manufacturing industry to make spelling mistakes earlier in the insert or on the outside part or even grammatical errors. And of course, when such things happen, we need to report that immediately. There are a number of countries that have put in certain um, report mechanism. And I think one of them is the, you know, the QR code. Uh, countries like Kenya have a web-based mechanism uh, some have um, uh, phone-based um, um, uh, 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 systems like shortcuts that you're able to report. So let us make good use of this. And sometimes just by reporting a single case, you're going to save several lives that we've seen that can be, can be lost. I'll rest and um, I'm happy to welcome any questions. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, as you keep posting your Q&A, um, on the, on the chat or on the Q&A tab, um, the speakers will attempt to answer your questions. I can see several questions are already answered. Uh, we have uh, seen that the threat of counterfeit drugs um, affects both uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. We've looked at, we've talked a lot about anti-malarials and chronic disease uh, medicines. We have uh, said that manufacturers have the responsibility of embedding some form of anti-counterfeit uh, mechanism on their packs, whether it's overt or covert. We've also seen that there's need for collaboration across the chain and that the chain is only as, as secure as the strength of its components. We also need to just make the patient uh, take these issues more seriously because it may be a matter of life and death. It was also very interesting to see that with a very simple technology, uh, we can dramatically reduce um, the counterfeit uh, or the suspected counterfeits from our markets as happened in Nigeria. And having done our part as industry and healthcare professionals, um, we, we have called on government uh, to regulate the sector effectively and to pay particular attention to new channels of access to drugs like online pharmacies and e-pharmacies. We can't run away from them, but we, we can step up the regulation so that we protect patients however they access their medicines. I'm going to just take a, a, a quick fire round where I'll ask each of our panelists to just give one or two sentences maximum in 30 seconds to give your parting shots uh, of this discussion. I'll start with uh, Mr. Aspinall. Hi, thanks, Daniela. Um, yeah, I'll keep it very brief. I think what's come across very clearly uh, in this session is that this is a problem that no single organization or group can solve by itself um, and that collaboration uh, across all sectors is absolutely critical. Um, one thing I'm really encouraged by is that there's a lot of very exciting uh, developments going on at the moment. Um, both in terms of new authentication and verification technology, uh, innovations in manufacturing and pack design. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't think we should lose sight of some, sometimes the fact that the simplest things such as media campaigns, TV and radio and, and press um, sensitization can be the most effective ways of reaching the people who are the end users and uh, who, as uh, Ashifi said, often have the, the most to lose. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the importance of uh, communication and using other channels of communication, such as mass media. Dr. Karakezi, your party shots. Thanks, Daniela, and thanks uh, to all the speakers. I believe it's the issue of empowering the individual, the patient, ensuring that they understand and just supporting the, the patient journey mm -hmm. and also using alternative means of education. For example, we've been working with community health workers who work at the household level. And I believe this is a forum that we can use even in terms of um, drugs and regulating issues of counterfeiting and so on. But I think as was mentioned, placing the patient at the center of mm -hmm. everything that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Amoy? Hello. Um, so 
one thing I, I've seen across um, the presentations is collaboration, 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 collaboration. Um, through the supply chain from manufacturing to the end user, collaboration on identification. Um, the second thing that I would like to um, say is that we can make a lot of noise about this, make sure we we take it to the government, make sure we take it to uh, the health authorities and also the ministers. And I, I believe that if there is a law that is put in place, uh, regulations that are put in place, um, we will be able to, you know, curb this counterfeiting and nip it at the bud uh, so that we don't have patients who get the counterfeit product. So let's continue to make noise about it. Let's continue to lobby. Let's continue to advocate. Um, let's continue to um, send the messages across. And just as um, Dr. Gogo worked with NAFDAQ, we can also work with other health authorities around Africa to ensure that uh, we combat counterfeit. Thank you. Let's not tire. No, Willie? no, we cannot tire. Yes, we can't. Willie, your closing remarks quickly. Thank you very much. This has been a very lively discussion. First thing to recognize is that counterfeit and presence of substandard medicines in the market is not an academic discussion. Mm. It's a reality. It's a health implication that can imply death. So whenever we talk about it, we talk about it with the, with the weight and uh, gravity it, it deserves. The point I'd like to make towards enhancing collaboration is, there's been a few questions on, uh, online about the capacity of the regulators. There, there's under-resourcing, there's under-capacitating of the regulators by the government. Uh, that also could define an innovative thinking issue. We are not innovating around our problems. Um, if you look at the example of Kenya, the number of field investigators or surveillance officers from pharmacy and poisons board is very limited, but they are unwilling to outsource self-regulation to, to, to the players. Um, I, for one, look at the potential for senior pharmacists in the market to be given more responsibility as oversight providers in regulation in regulating the market. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just killing that purest thing that we've struggled against. It does not have to be a member of the regulatory board. The regulatory board can create mechanisms that senior players in the market can be part of the regulatory system. And that mm -hmm. helps with collaboration. It helps with better utilization of scarce resources on the ground. Thank you. Absolutely. Dr. Shah, your parting shots. The WHO approximates that 10% of the global pharmaceutical market consists of counterfeit drugs, but this estimate increases to 25% for developing countries and may exceed to 50% in certain countries. And even though we have strong national medicine regulatory authorities with the capacity to exert effective market control through proper monitoring and surveillance, some of the illicit suppliers within this sector are devising more cunning ways to ensure counterfeit drugs reach the market. And entering the commercial market, they bring in a health, political, and economic burden. While proliferation of counterfeits is a known complex and global issue, that transcends national boundaries. The solution lies in advocating and sensitizing and making aware to our patients and the general public how life is so precious 
and hence it is so important accessing quality genuine medicine so always access from authorized reputable pharmacies hashtag a better you every day thank you i can't add anything to that thank you uh, dr shah dr ashifi your parting shots sure i i really like what mr sorina said about using our terrain and the unique properties it has to um to our advantage and have innovative thinking around the solutions that we design customized to our specific needs you know using things like the social bonds the social social con uh, contracts that we have that can be very strong and the trust and the respect and these cultural values that uh, people can understand you know both in cities all the way down to the last mile to our advantage to design systems that will help build trust and share the burden of the task of either pharmacovigilance, you know, with some training to be able to get us to a place where people can trust the products that they put in their bodies. Um, we can't copy and paste from the West because we don't have the same terrain uh, to, to work with. And we have to be open-minded and, and innovative in the way that we think about solutions for the continent. And, and we also have to use the resources we have. We can't just say we don't have enough resources. We have to make it fit what we have. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. John Polomolo, you get the privilege of giving the final parting shot. <laughs> they say that last but not least. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. I think for me, I'll start by saying safety starts with me and you. And so don't, we should not ignore the slightest thing. Even if you report, but it was a genuine drug, you'd rather report than not report. And then uh, you find that it was a fake drug. And of course there is need to, for us as countries, as a patient group to strengthen our accountability mechanism and engagement on regulatory systems at country level. We need to be part of those discussions and call out for government to strengthen regulatory systems in the country, across the regions and across the border, because over the time we've seen um, the voice of the patient missing when at the end of it, the person who is suffering is a patient. So we need to look for those spaces at country level and be part of those conversations so that we can influence uh, the conversations around strengthening of regulatory systems and structures at country level for the sake of everybody, including the patients themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to call upon um, the co-curator of this session, uh, Mr. Arnaud Burnett from SICPA to wrap it up for us. Mr. Arnaud, if you could uh, put on your video. Yes, we can see you. But we can't hear you though. Arnaud, I think you need to change the source of your audio. Let's give Arnaud um, a few seconds to sort out his audio. SIGPA has really been at the forefront of uh, educating governments, the public and industry about anti-counterfeit technologies. And, um, and we're really glad to partner with them. Now we can hear you, go ahead. It's still coming and going. Sorry. Sorry, can okay. you hear me? Now we can hear. We've been enjoying the sunny view of uh, summer. The mountains in Switzerland. No, <laughs> Elisa, and I, I'm going to be extremely short. I mean, only three things. The first one, I would like to thank all the speakers. I learned a lot personally. And uh, thank you to you, Daniela. Thank you also, Saloni, for setting it up. The second thing is uh, we learn from your, your insights and uh, as a technology provider for health security solutions, and uh, wants to combat uh, uh, falsified medicines. I mean, 
it can help us guide our product development roadmap. So that's also super important. And I think advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. I mean, one million uh, people being killed every year by criminals. Uh, they are criminals. This is, uh, if it was one, of, one disease, it would be one of the top 10 diseases. It would be the equivalent of hepatitis B and C combined. So I, I, I would like to see that more prominent features in, in, in the agenda and the, and the date we picked for this webinar was not coincidental. This is precisely because this is a World Health Assembly week. So I think with AA. You have muted by mistake, you can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yeah, we would, would like to make sure that uh, when the next disease burden report is going to be published by IHME, I think this should be uh, referred to clearly as one of the causes of death that is uh, the most preventable. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Arnaud, for that reminder um, that counterfeit drugs uh, lead to a lot of death and suffering, and it is preventable. Uh, by the constituents, constituencies that are represented in this meeting. Um, I would like to really thank you all for your attention and we're really sorry for running out of time. The insights were too sweet and useful, uh, but we've come to the end of our session. And I'd like to um, really uh, appreciate the distinguished panel uh, for taking your time and sharing your, your very uh, well-researched and insights from your experience. I'd like to also bring to your attention some uh, events that are uh, coming up uh, on the AHB calendar. Uh, on your screen, you'll see a, a code you can scan to register for this webinar series. We have a webinar series that we've done the first one on NCDs, and we have the next one in July on building patient-centric digital health ecosystems pretty much aligned to what we were talking today about putting the patient in the center. So you can just scan um, the code to register. There's also a link on the chat that you can use to uh, register. The, the third webinar will be on um, Africa's production of vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. We have seen a huge need for Africa to be um, self-reliant in manufacture of their own health products and technologies. Since the COVID pandemic, the continent is waking up to that um, necessity, and we're going to be unraveling that topic in September. And finally, in October, we'll talk about uh, disease surveillance for infectious diseases and how we can boost our continent's capacity. And this is all uh, in, in strengthening our path towards uh, stronger African healthcare systems uh, and filling the gaps that have been highlighted by the COVID pandemic. The other event we have uh, will be an in-person event in Nairobi that will also be hybrid. Um, this will be a conference on men's health and we're gonna be looking at the role of the private sector in advancing men's health in Africa. Again, you can scan that code and register or you can follow the link that Saloni has put on the chat. Uh, do have a good evening or morning or mid-afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much for being with us today. We'll see you in the webinar series and in the conference in November. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.